Today on Brief History, we take a look at a king who would be one of the longest serving heirs in British history. During his life, he would experience a difficult upbringing and ultimately rebel in incredible ways as he aged. His life and reign would see sexual scandal, devastating loss, international war, and an indulgent prince coming into his own. Join me as I take a brief look at Prince Bertie, remembered today as King Edward VII of the United Kingdom. Prince Albert Edward was born on November 9, 1841 at Buckingham Palace in London, England. He was the son of Queen Victoria of the United Kingdom, and his father was a man named Albert of saxe coburg gotha Although Edward is known today by the name Edward, it should be noted that this was not the name that he was called throughout his life and was the name that he chose after becoming king. For the majority of his life, he was referred to as Bertie, a shortened nickname of his true first name, Albert. Nevertheless, for simplicity purposes, he will be referred to as Edward here. Edward was the second child between his parents, and him being the eldest male child between his parents made him the heir apparent to the British crown from birth. He would be one of nine children, some of his siblings will come up throughout his story, and he was created Prince of Wales shortly after his birth, a title he would hold for a long duration of time. Edward's life, even from his conception, started off on the wrong foot as his mother Victoria in her youth detested childbearing and was disappointed, even angry, to learn that she had become pregnant with Edward. His birth was said to have been difficult as he was born a very large child. The queen was said to have shown little interest in her new baby son, not only due to her dislike of pregnancy, but also due to her dislike of children until they reached a certain age. Thus, the unfortunate relationship between mother and son began, which, as we will see, would continue to grow further in the wrong direction. The queen thought Edward was ugly and refused to breastfeed him, although it should be noted that she thought all babies were ugly and thought that breastfeeding was a disgusting practice. Initially, Edward's only companion early on during his time in the nursery was his elder sister Victoria, who was nicknamed Vicky, and she set the tone for the next years of Edward's life. Unfortunately, Vicky was a favorite of Edward's parents, and they doted and showed great affection towards her. She was a very capable and bright child and was skilled in her learning. This contrasted poorly with Edward, who soon began to show signs that he was not as gifted as his older sister. Edward always submitted to his elder sister during these years, and for a time believed that it would be Vicky who would become the monarch instead of him. Edward could not grasp his lessons as efficiently as Vicky did, and soon he was displaying traits that, ironically, his mother had been famous for in her youth, which included tantrums. By the time he was three, he was refusing to do his lessons, and this caused his parents to come to the conclusion that Edward was simply mentally handicapped. However, in 1843, another sibling was born, Alice, Edward's younger sister. Edward was said to have had the closest relationship with Alice of all of his siblings in his youth, and indeed, the pair would remain close into adulthood. Despite having siblings, he was schooled in seclusion, just as the previous Hanoverian monarchs had before him, which included his mother. As one could imagine from the personality traits already discussed, this attempted secluded schooling was an absolute failure for Edward. He was forced to take his lessons alone and was refused access to children his age. Given how this clashed with his personality, Edward's progress was slow or at times non-existent, and this was a great concern to his parents and those overseeing his education. By the time he was seven, Edward's father, Prince Albert, personally took control in directing his son's education, which began by bringing a tutor on named Henry Birch. The tantrums and disobedient behavior continued on, however, and Edward's learning continued to fall short of expectation. Whippings from Albert ensued, which only fixed the issues for a short time. However, by the time Edward turned nine years old, things finally began to improve for the young Prince of Wales. Unfortunately, Edward's father, Albert, removed his tutor, Birch, right when things were beginning to take a turn for the better. A new tutor was installed named Frederick Gibbs, and it was not long before all the progress that Birch had made with Edward, which was mainly gained by showing the young boy affection, was undone. Edward's father intensified his schooling and directed that he should study longer and more intensely, 
The tantrums and fits of anger returned. Edward also began to make faces, call people names, fight with his brother, hit his tutor with a stick, scream loudly, and stamp his feet in anger. Although some were advising Edward's father, Albert, to implement a lighter regiment of learning, Albert refused to consider it. Of course, today we can see that this acting out was a result of an overworked and underloved child seeking attention and being unable to control the at times cruel treatment he was enduring. But at the time, few realized what was happening, and some began to believe that Edward had inherited a strain of madness from his great-grandfather, George III. Edward grew up with little sympathy or love, and by the time he was 14, he learned to live a secret life, something that he would be famous for in his adult life. He began to secretly smoke with his young brother Alfred, who would later become Duke of Saxe, Coburg, and Gotha in his adult life. Edward, who was three years older than Alfred, had developed a bond with his younger brother over the years, but unfortunately this was ripped from Edward as well when Alfred was moved to a separate establishment, which caused Edward to break down into tears. It seemed that Edward could not find his way within the British royal family, and given his at times cruel upbringing, it is not surprising. But this was only the beginning. Edward was slowly growing into an adult, and when it became time for the young prince to spread his wings, he would do so in a most incredible way. When Edward was 15 in 1857, it was determined that he would no longer be educated alone, and thus his father decided to send him abroad with a carefully selected group of aristocratic companions in order to continue his education. Edward was still, unsurprisingly, incredibly immature for his age, and the new companions finally gave him a chance to vent some of the schoolboy angst that had built up over the years, which manifested itself in tomfoolery. His host abroad commented on his immaturity, as Edward often behaved as a young child would have. The following year, Edward's elder sister, Vicky, was married off to Frederick of Prussia, who would eventually become the German emperor years later. Victoria was critical of all of her children at times, even the gifted Vicky, and so this meant that Edward was sheltered to a degree from his mother's critical eye, as there were other siblings his age to incur her anger. With Vicky leaving, this unfortunately meant that the queen now could direct more of her attention and criticisms towards her son due to the eldest child now being out of the picture and in Germany. The queen began to more fervently comment on Edward's laziness and dullness, and adamantly opposed him having any sort of military career, something that Edward greatly desired at the time. Victoria's distaste for her eldest son and heir was seemingly always growing, and their relationship would never really get better until much later in their lives. But it should be noted here that Victoria has been long remembered for her tendency to wax and wane when it came to loving and disdaining her children, as she often at times found them a great disappointment, but would also at times find them a source of great pride and contentment. Edward was certainly not the only child that experienced his mother's criticism, but he was perhaps the one who experienced the worst of it. Nevertheless, there would be times throughout his life that the queen spoke highly of him or showed him affection, just not often or for long periods of time. When Edward was confirmed at 16, he was given his own establishment, which was set at White Lodge in Richmond Park. His tutors joined him to continue his education, and again, some young men were chosen to accompany him as, quote, friends, who, it was hoped, could set a good example for him. Edward remained dedicated to living an honorary life and participated in practical jokes while making little progress in his studies. His tutor was soon replaced by a governor, a man named Robert Bruce, and at the time colonel in the British Army. Despite Bruce's strict disciplinary nature, Edward continued to waste his days away, gaining little in the form of education or experience. It was eventually determined by Edward's father that the young prince was to study at Oxford, and in 1859, he traveled there to begin further training. He, of course, was separated from the other students and was forced to live yet again in isolation. This forced isolation caused Edward to grow angry at his treatment, as he, understandably, wished to interact with the young people his age in a freer and more open manner. His father and mother continued to chastise him for his poor behavior, which only added fuel to Bertie's fire of pent-up adolescence. Despite the limitations placed on the young prince, Edward was able to connect with some less than reputable people, at least in the eyes of his parents and governor, mainly Sir Frederick Johnston. Johnston drank, gambled, and womanized, and was the first individual to lead the young prince in his first baby steps towards the life he would long be remembered for. Edward was becoming acutely aware now of his celebrity, 
and he found great pride and excitement in this. He went on a tour of Canada and of the United States and was able to meet the at the time president, James Buchanan. After returning to Oxford, it was determined that Edward would now study at Cambridge, where he traveled in 1861 in order to enroll at Trinity. Here he was finally allowed a vice when his father gave him permission to smoke. This surely was an invigorating moment for Edward and thus began the long lasting habit that would eventually not only become part of his character, but eventually kill him. Edward was a big fan of cigars, and over his life, his cigar consumption would reach monumental proportions. It was said that he could, at times, consume up to 12 cigars a day, which was complemented by 20 cigarettes or so. At Cambridge, Edward finally began to meet new friends who would begin to shape his future life, and it seemed that the young prince was finally coming into his own as a young man. Unfortunately, events were to take a disastrous turn for the worse for the Prince of Wales. Edward's father reluctantly agreed to let him, on suggestion from his governor, travel to a military camp at the Carraw in Ireland in 1861 with the Grenadier Guards. Here he was allowed to mix with the rank and file officers of the camp, and unsurprisingly, a scandal developed. By the late 1850s and early 1860s, a new interest had come onto Edward's radar, an interest that comes onto most young men's radar at this time in their lives, women. Bertie had already been caught writing secret letters to ladies-in-waiting to the Queen previously, but his interaction with the opposite sex took a dramatic turn here in Ireland. He had his first interactions with a young woman named Nellie Clifton, who eventually became a regular sexual partner for him, and today is remembered as one of his most famous mistresses. She eventually followed Edward to England, where, through her and many of the other army officers, Edward took his first debaucherous steps into London nightlife, filled with gambling, drinking, and women of the night. Word of Edward's interactions with Nellie Clifton began to leak, and when word reached his mother and father, the response was fierce. Albert angrily scolded his son for the brash behavior and lack of understanding Edward was exhibiting. The chance for blackmail for a person in Edward's position was serious and indeed was something that Edward would have to deal with years later, so Albert's comments were not necessarily wrong or over-exaggerated per se. Furthermore, this information leaking abroad could potentially hinder marriage prospects for Edward. In fact, Edward's father Albert had already been planning a marriage for Edward for some time, and the prince consort was keen on making sure that Edward married for dynastic purposes, as Edward's siblings had done or would do in the future. The princess that was being eyed for Edward was Alexandra of Denmark, who was nicknamed Alex. Unfortunately, Alexandra's Danish family had been fighting over the territory of Schleswig-Holstein for some time with Prussia, and this had worried Albert at the time due to his strong German preferences. Alexandra was of notable beauty, and Edward had declared that he would marry her at once after seeing a photograph. Edward's public affair with Nellie Clifton risked ruining the Danish match that his father was attempting to bring forth, or so he thought. Albert decided to travel to Cambridge to confront his son over the matter, and father and son were said to have taken a walk in the rain to hash out the matter. Although Albert was contented with his conversation with his son, he returned to England as a sick man. Edward's father had been sick for some time, as he had experienced stomach issues, back and leg pain, insomnia, and depression, which had been exacerbated by his stressful work life. He had taken on much of the Queen's responsibilities privately, and it was now beginning to greatly affect his health. Within a few weeks of returning to England, Albert became bedridden with typhoid. The Queen refused to send for her son and heir, as she believed that Edward had played a role in his father's sickness. Luckily, Edward's younger sister Alice summoned him home to be with his father as he lay ill. Edward, along with his mother and siblings, surrounded Albert as he lay dying at Windsor. On December 14, 1861, Edward's father breathed his last, which sent the Queen into hysterics. Surprisingly, Albert's death initially brought Edward and his mother closer together, as Edward remained in her room and waited on her in an attempt to stymie her grief. This, unfortunately, was not to last. The doctors blamed Albert's death on mental excitement, fatigue, or cold in order to lessen their involvement in his death. Victoria interpreted this to mean that it was Edward who had caused his father's death with his poor choices related to the Nellie Clifton affair, which had brought forth the stress for his father. After this, the Queen began to look at her son and heir with utter disgust and disdain, continuing the long-held tradition of Hanoverian monarchs being at odds with their eldest son and heirs. Edward later in life would finally break with this tradition, as we will see, and would treat his children much more fairly than he had been treated by his parents. This would no doubt be brought forth, at least in part, as a positive consequence 
of the unfair and poor treatment he received from his mother at times during his own youth. Edward's mother was distraught at the death of her beloved husband, who she had relied so heavily on, not only for political purposes, but for emotional purposes as well. Albert's death sent the Queen into a bout of extended mourning that would go down in history for its incredibility. She removed herself from all society and withdrew into a reclusive life of quiet and sorrow. She refused to see her ministers, refused to open Parliament, refused to partake in public events, and refused to live at Buckingham in London. This, in theory, should have brought forth great opportunity for Edward, who had the chance to take the reins and become an important figure in his mother's time as monarch. But Bertie was unfortunately unprepared and idle, and was not able to take advantage of the opportunity that was before him. The Queen soon was actively working to keep her son out of the processes of government, something she would do, to a degree, for the rest of her life. Edward was to remain an idle, uninformed prince for many years, at least when it came to politics and government. But this idleness was not to last forever, as there were other areas that he was needed now that his mother had implemented such dramatic changes in her personal life. Although being greatly limited in the affairs of state, he was a necessity for the queen in public affairs. The queen wanted to remain as reclusive as possible and did not want to continue to partake in the public duties that were required of her. Thus, she began to lean heavily on Edward to essentially take over that role for the monarchy. In the coming years, it would not be the reigning monarch Victoria who interacted with the public regularly, but her son and heir, Edward. Although the Queen was resentful and angry with Edward, she was still committed to following through with Albert's plan to see him married off. Thus, after sending her son away for a few months, she continued working on getting a marriage settlement negotiated. Edward had no say in the matter, and the match was arranged completely by his mother and elder sister Vicky, who was, as we remember, now living on the continent in Germany. Edward officially proposed to Alexandra of Denmark upon his return, and the pair were wed in 1863. The prince, and now Princess of Wales, after the honeymoon traveled to a place that Edward had purchased in 1862 in Norfolk, called Sandringham House. This house would be a major residence for Edward and Alex, and continues to be a royal residence of British monarchs to this day. In London, however, Edward and his wife were installed in Marlborough House near Buckingham Palace and St. James Palace. This place would become notorious for the lifestyle Edward would soon implement there, although initially the young prince remained in line. The queen attempted to control the young royal couple's every move from her rural palaces of Osborne on the Isle of Wight and Balmoral in Scotland, which of course burdened Edward and Alex greatly. Unfortunately, serious family trouble soon arose due to the international picture at the time. Although Queen Victoria and Prince Albert are often commended or even glorified for spreading their dynastic royal family throughout the royal families of Europe via marriages, this at times caused great awkwardness within Edward's immediate family, especially when it came to war and nations who were in conflict with each other. We remember that Edward's sister Vicky was married to the Prince of Prussia, a major player in the German Confederation at the time. We also remember that Edward's wife, Alex, was from Denmark, and that Prussia and Denmark were quarreling over the territory of Schleswig-Holstein. When Edward's father-in-law became king of Denmark in 1863, he moved to incorporate Schleswig-Holstein into Denmark, which upset Vicky's Prussian family. Edward's mother, for her part, supported Vicky and the Prussians. The Second Schleswig War broke out in 1864, which saw a resounding victory for the Prussians to Edward and his Danish wife's dismay. Although Edward had certainly complained about his mother in the past, he had always maintained or attempted to maintain a degree of obedience to her wishes. But when it came to the Second Schleswig War, he finally departed from this and opposed her. Alex was angry and distraught at her Danish family's losses to the Prussians, and she made it be known. Edward, despite his mother's orders to resist Danish influences, fervently supported his wife and the Danes. Edward was becoming increasingly fond of his wife, and the relationship was, at the time, very strong and loving. In fact, prior to the Second Schleswig War, Alex had delivered her and Edward's first child, who was born two months premature and very small. It was a boy who was named Albert Victor, but who would be referred to as Eddie throughout his life. It should also be noted at this point that Edward and Alex would have six children together, of which five would survive to adulthood, but not all of these children will be discussed here. In addition to Prince Eddie, another son named George, or Georgie as he was nicknamed, would be born to the couple in 1865, a year after Eddie's birth. Both of Edward's sons will come up again throughout the rest of his story. Edward's defiant attitudes towards his mother's wishes with regard to the Second Schleswig War 
was the first step in him attaining the independence he had been desiring his entire life. This would, of course, not be the last time that he defied his mother's wishes, and soon, this independence would bring forth great scandal for the young prince. As Edward began to stray further from his mother's wishes, and at times openly oppose her, his lifestyle changed dramatically. His mother and father had been, or had attempted to be, morally upstanding individuals who looked down on people who lived a much faster life. Given Edward's personality, desire to escape his mother's clutches, and his inability to find any real work within government, this morally deplorable person, as Victoria might have called it, is exactly the type of individual Edward was looking to find as a companion, or indeed become himself. It was not long before he took up company with the sporting aristocracy where he began to shoot, hunt, gamble, drink, and smoke. However, the most serious change that came about around this time was Edward's relationship with his wife, Alex. Edward, although always showing his wife respect, or perhaps cordiality is the right word, began to tire of her as she was very emotionally attached to him and was absorbed in their children's life. She was still becoming pregnant and delivering their children, but Edward began to stray from his wife little by little. He began to enjoy the company of other women, especially when he traveled abroad while his wife stayed in Britain. Furthermore, Alex had a long-term injury to her knee, which affected her movement and brought forth great pain for the young princess. She was also growing increasingly deaf, something that she would struggle with for the remainder of her life. This forced limitations on the royal couple's physical interactions, at least for a time, and only caused Edward to stray further into the life of late nights out away from his oftentimes sick and ailing wife. It should be noted, however, that Edward did not simply discard his wife or treat her disrespectfully in public, as he still held affection for her and made sure she was taken care of. Nevertheless, the sins of the flesh were too much for Edward to overcome, and his vices began to control him more and more. When traveling to Paris for the Paris Exposition, he fell right in line with the debaucherous court of Napoleon III. With a death-invalid wife at home, Edward felt perfectly reconciled to engage in the adulterous behavior he has long been remembered for, and some have concluded that this was probably a way to revenge himself against his overbearing mother. Unfortunately, Princess Alex was an innocent victim of this personality that Edward had developed due to his difficult upbringing, which brought out a very deep-rooted resentment towards the Queen. Alex had other issues to worry about as well, especially related to her family abroad. Prior to Edward traveling to Paris in 1866, the Austro-Prussian War had broke out between Austria and Prussia over the control of the German states. Prussia once again was triumphant and punished the states who had supported Austria, which had included Hesse Castle, who was controlled by Prince Alex's grandfather. Alex's grandfather was removed as a sovereign and his kingdom was absorbed by Prussia, which of course upset the princess. Hanover was also one of the states that were affected by this conflict and was also absorbed by Prussia due to their choice to support Austria in this conflict. This is interesting in that prior to Edward's mother Victoria coming to the British throne, Hanover had been ruled in a personal union by the British Hanoverian monarchs. This had begun with the first Hanoverian King George I and ended with Queen Victoria's uncle and predecessor William IV. Victoria could not be Queen of Hanover because Hanover practiced Salic law and thus the Hanoverian throne went to her uncle at the time of her accession. The King of Hanover at the time of the Austro-Prussian War was George V who was deposed and was Edward's first cousin once removed. George V of Hanover, like Queen Victoria, was a grandson of King George III of Great Britain. Thus, with these aggressive moves on the side of Prussia, relations between Edward and his sister Vicky were once again strained as she of course remained in the Prussian camp on account of her marriage. A visit from Edward calmed these tensions between the two eldest siblings, but tensions between Britain and Germany would continue to escalate as time went on, as we will see. By 1867, Edward was settling himself in Marlborough House and began to surround himself with the indulgent and interesting men that tripped his leisurely trigger. The Marlborough Club was created near Marlborough House, where smoking was a major focus of activity, among many other things. Although Edward was involved in ribbon cuttings, dinners, tree plantings, and the laying of foundation stones, he was still a mostly idle prince who has refused any involvement in the mechanisms of government. 1868 would be an unfortunate year for Edward due to his poor choices in women. He began to interact privately with a woman named Harriet Mordaunt, who he visited often while her husband was away. 
These visits were presumably for intimate relations with Mrs. Mordaunt. Harriet was an odd woman and was said to have acted strangely often, even more so after the events we are about to get into. Edward and Harriet exchanged letters, photographs, and gifts, but he tended to be very cryptic in his writing, not just with her, but with many other letters he wrote to everyone. So the letters he wrote to Harriet were not necessarily intimate per se. Harriet Mordaunt was also interacting privately with other men as well, and she soon became pregnant with one of these men's child. Harriet decided to come clean to her husband, a man named Charles Mordaunt, and confessed her adultery to him. This enraged her husband so much that he set about destroying her and those who he believed had been involved with his wife, which of course included Edward. Thus, the first serious scandal since the Nellie Clifton affair came about for the Prince of Wales as a result of his interactions with Harriet Mordaunt. A divorce suit was a public affair at the time, and it was many aristocratic men's worst fear to have to sit in the witness box in such a trial. With the rage that Charles Mordaunt was experiencing, there was no doubt that he wanted Edward in the witness box himself as a form of public humiliation. Charles found the letters that were written between Edward and his wife, and he believed that this would be the smoking gun that proved the allegations against the prince. Aided by her father, Harriet Mordaunt pleaded insanity and began to act erratically, many believe on orders from her father. In February 1870, the divorce suit came to Westminster Hall, and Edward was indeed unfortunately required to give testimony. Luckily, Edward had friends in high places that assisted with this. After easy questions from Harriet's lawyers, Charles Mordaunt's lawyers declined to cross-examine him, which was probably due to the influence of a man named William Gladstone, a prime minister of Edward's mother's. The court ruled that indeed Harriet Mordaunt was mad, and the divorce suit was not granted. Edward had dodged a bullet, which had been also aided by the unimpressive nature of the letters he had written to Harriet, which were not all that incriminating at all. But although he may have been off the hook to a degree, poor Harriet Mordaunt was not. She was committed to a mental institution for the rest of her life, dying in 1906, essentially in captivity. Where Edward was not off the hook, however, was in the public's eye or in the press, where he began to face serious criticism. The Prince of Wales' unpopularity began to grow, as the people began to see him as a philandering wastrel. Despite this, and despite the unquestioning support he received from his wife Alex, Edward's attitude changed little after the scandal, and he continued on in his womanizing ways. But it was not just Edward who was facing serious criticism at the time. Edward's mother, the Queen, had remained a recluse, for the most part at Osborne, Balmoral, and Windsor, and continued to decline to partake in public events or ceremonies. Although initially Queen Victoria's mourning brought forth great sympathy after Albert's death, as time went on, the populace began to detest the sovereign they never saw. Why, some began to ask, should the population continue to pay for a monarch when they had nothing to show for it? Would it not be better to have a president who cost significantly less? Furthermore, the Franco-Prussian War broke out in 1870, and the Queen supported the Prussians yet again, which added to her unpopularity, as many saw her, correctly, as being biased towards her German family members. Edward, for his part, supported France, and the fall of Napoleon III sent a wave of republicanism through Britain, who now saw Edward as the same type of potential sovereign as the deposed Napoleon III, due to his time spent in Paris at Napoleon III's court in the years past. The monarchy was in serious danger, as certain press outlets sympathetic to republicanism lambasted the royal family nonstop. However, events were about to take a serious and dangerous turn as Edward began to complain of sickness at Sandringham on his 30th birthday. As more and more symptoms came about, it was determined that Edward had contracted typhoid, the sickness that had killed his father just under 10 years prior. Like his father, Edward began to experience severe symptoms which included rambling incoherence and an inability to recognize close family members. Despite the contentious relationship between Edward and his mother, the Queen, Victoria was very worried about her son and traveled to Sandringham for the first time to be with the ailing prince. The nation came along for the ride and was enthralled by the drama that was unfolding within the royal family. Incredibly, despite Edward coming very close to death, this sickness was a blessing in disguise. Edward eventually began to recover, and this brought forth great sympathy for the royal family, which ultimately destroyed the Republican movements in Britain. This was aided by the Queen's reluctant agreement to come out of hiding once again and face the populace. Slowly, the Queen was led from her isolation into the public eye, which gave the people what they had been hoping for, a monarchy they could see to be working. Unfortunately, 
the Prince of Wales was to remain on the outskirts of government and was still refused work by his mother, who continued to see him as incapable of becoming king after her. Although no one knew it at the time, the aging Queen Victoria still had a lot of life left to live, and unfortunately for her son, the idle Prince of Wales, this meant that he would have to endure more scandals and tragedies before his time came. As the years went on, and Edward and Alec's physical intimacy began to decline, Edward continued on, if not expanded, his philandering ways. There would be no shortage of mistresses that would enter the picture over the remainder of his life, but some of the most well-known include Catherine Walters, known as Skittles, Mary Cornwallis West, known as Patsy, Emily Charlotte, known as Lily Langtree, Jenny Churchill, mother of the famous Winston Churchill, Frances Greville, known as Daisy Brooke or Daisy Work, and perhaps most famously, Alice Keppel, one of Edward's longtime mistresses who would enter the picture later in his life, but who would still be around when he died. Much has been made of Edward's adulterous private life, but given the fact that there is so much other information related to his life, just a few of these mistresses will come up again throughout the rest of Edward's story, and only briefly. In October 1875, Edward set out on a trip to India, and Alex was not allowed to go, something that upset her greatly. Edward's mother by that time was seeking the title of Empress of India, something that would actually come about as a result of the influence of a man named Benjamin Disraeli, who pushed for this change to take place. A group of men from the so-called Marlborough set, that being Edward's inner circle at the Marlborough Club, joined him on his expedition to India. The trip, from a public relations standpoint, was a resounding success, and the Queen, who initially did not want Edward to go, benefited greatly from this action. Unfortunately, another scandal would erupt while the trip was taking place. In February 1876, a woman named Edith Piers Williams, the Countess of Aylesford, sent her husband, nicknamed Sporting Joe, a letter that she had been unfaithful while he was away. Sporting Joe had traveled with Edward to India, and this sparked a scandal. The story is quite complex, but in essence, it was gossiped that Edward had competed with another man to be Edith's lover, and Edward had allegedly promised this other man that if he was able to have relations with Edith at the time, he would take her husband away on a trip so that the other man could have Edith to himself while her husband was away. Whether this is true or not cannot be verified, but this is the word that leaked out and spread quickly. Again, Edward found himself involved in yet another potentially disastrous divorce suit, and he worked hard to prevent Edith and Sporting Joe from taking this to court. In the end, Sporting Joe was convinced to avoid a public divorce in favor of a private legal separation, which averted the scandal publicly at least. Nevertheless, it went to show that Edward was living life dangerously on the edge of scandal. Furthermore, his mother continued to exclude him from government and began to show Edward's younger brother, the hemophiliac Leopold, more favor in this regard, although Leopold would die shortly thereafter in 1884. Thus, although Edward continued to take part in public engagements, like visiting schools and hospitals, he still remained idle and continued to live a life of pleasure and leisure, often shooting, hunting, eating, and partying. By the end of the 1880s, his finances were very tight, and so he turned to moneylenders in order to assist with this problem. Edward, like his mother, had never held social prejudices, something that angered many of his friends and family, and when it came to money, the Jewish community was best suited to assist Edward with his troubles. Indeed, many did, and were allowed into the Marlborough Club to the disdain of many around the prince. However, money was also the source of yet another scandal related to a man named Sir William Gordon Cumming, who was accused of cheating at a game of Baccarat in what is known today as the Tranby Croft Affair in 1890. Edward was called as a witness and was yet again forced to give testimony in this embarrassing affair. Although Cumming was found guilty, Edward was reaching yet another crest of unpopularity during his life, as it seemed that his debaucherous life was continuously producing scandal after scandal. Another serious concern that Edward was forced to deal with was the issue of his sons. Edward's sons had grown up over the years, but their lives had been anything but simple. Edward had always been affectionate towards his children to a degree, but had also been absent for the most part. Their education was delegated to tutors, and unfortunately, this led to serious trouble for his sons. Edward's eldest son, Albert Victor, or Eddie, as he was referred to, was of course presumed to be his father's heir once Queen Victoria died. But Eddie was a quiet and slow developing child and had done poorly in his learning as he aged. Part of the problem was that the tutor that Edward and Alex had installed to oversee the training did a poor job with the princes and was not experienced enough to give the young boys what they needed intellectually. 
Although both boys had difficulties, Eddie struggled most and was not coming along as his parents had hoped. George, on the other hand, was much more able and capable and showed promising character and drive. Both of Edward's sons had been sent to sea, and although George had done well during this time, Eddie continued to lack substantial gains. Thus, the princes were separated and Eddie was sent to Cambridge to study. By the time Eddie left Cambridge to join a cavalry regiment, he was still inadequate in his understanding of the world. Prince Eddie has his own incredible story which will not be discussed in full detail here, but there was a scandal that surrounded him during this time. He was thought to have possibly been bisexual, and his name was connected with the so-called Cleveland Street Scandal, which involved a homosexual brothel being discovered in London, homosexuality being illegal at the time. Whether Eddie was truly tied in with this can never truly be known, but it was nevertheless determined that Eddie seriously needed a wife. He was created Duke of Clarence, and a bride, Mary, nicknamed May, of Tech, was selected. Unfortunately, the marriage was never to take place. While out shooting, Eddie became ill and was taken back into the house to recover. As it turned out, he had contracted influenza, an illness which had been particularly bad that year. The prince went downhill quickly and unfortunately developed pneumonia as a complication of his illness. After his condition continued to deteriorate, it was determined that Eddie was unlikely to survive. Edward, his wife, and his other children were forced to sit and watch Eddie struggle for life for seven hours as the sickness slowly and graphically took him away from the world. Eddie died in January, which meant that his younger brother George was now his father's heir. Given the difficulties that Eddie had had during his life and the opinion that he would be unfit to be king, many saw his death as a terrible blessing politically. Edward was distraught at his son's death, and this was a moment of change for him forever. He may have been somewhat distant towards his sons in their youth, but he never quarreled with them, which ended the long-standing tradition that had been set by the Hanoverian dynasty that had preceded him. What distance may have existed in his son's youth was gapped as they aged, as George in particular would benefit greatly from his father's assistance. Later in life, Edward would go out of his way to make sure that his son and heir came to the throne prepared and was not treated as his mother had treated him. Indeed, Prince George would comment after his father's death how much he was grieved by the loss of such a close friend and mentor. The death of his son and presumed heir Eddie troubled Edward for the rest of his life, and it was after this sad event that Edward began to interact with his mistresses differently. He became less sexually driven and leaned more heavily on them for emotional support and companionship. The two of his mistresses that would fill this role most prominently would be Lady Warwick, aka Daisy, and Alice Keppel. They, particularly Daisy Warwick, played an important role in influencing Edward to be more giving in his ways and pushed the heir apparent towards philanthropy, something that Edward would become known for due to his giving. Alex, for her part, was not happy with her husband's interactions with these mistresses, and although she had continued to hold affection towards him and had oftentimes looked past his infidelity, she now began to become ever more disgruntled with the women who dominated her husband's private life. But by the late 1890s, Edward was in his mid-50s and was beginning to show his age. His beard had grayed, his waist had grown, and the ailment slowly began to climb. He continued to smoke heavily, which, as we will see, would ultimately have serious consequences for him. But Bertie's day was nearly at hand. His aging mother, the Queen, had become the longest reigning monarch in British history, surpassing her grandfather, George III. There was little time left for the old matriarch. A new day was about to dawn in Britain. By the late 1890s, the old queen was nearing her 80s. She was suffering from a multitude of ailments, including blindness and lameness. The relationship between her and her heir, Edward, had warmed over the last decade or so, but she still refused to allow him to take part in government. But age was quickly catching up with the queen, and Victoria was soon confined to her bedroom after she was devastated by the losses of family members, which included Edward's younger brother and childhood companion, Alfred of Saxe-Coburg Gotha. Soon, the Queen was acting confused and incoherent, and it seemed that the end was finally at hand for her. Edward traveled to Osborne with his family, and sat next to his dying mother over the course of some time. In a moment of lucidity, the old Queen called for her son and heir. When he entered the room, she asked him to kiss her face and said his name, Bertie, which is said to have been her last word. As the night came to a close, and the sun rose the following morning, the family was summoned to Victoria's bedside, 
where the longest reigning monarch to ever live at the time breathed her last breaths in January 1901. Edward was finally, after decades as the Prince of Wales, the King of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland at 59 years of age. Edward was saddened by his mother's death and found it difficult to speak of the matter to his counselors. One of his first actions was to declare that he would be known as King Edward and that his legal first name, Albert, was to be eliminated from his title. Given his past as a philandering party-going idle prince, the expectations for Edward were low, and not many believed that the new king would provide strong leadership as the years went by. They were to find that they were wrong in this aspect. Edward immediately set about distinguishing himself from his mother's style of rule. Although the late queen had finally come out of seclusion later in life and had regained some popularity, she still remained a very private monarch, and this was not how Edward wanted the monarch to be viewed. Major changes ensued. He moved the monarchy back to Buckingham Palace after 40 years of disuse. He opened the royal palaces and once again tried to revive the majesty and public grandeur of the British sovereign. He opened Parliament in his robes while wearing the imperial state crown and began the process of morphing the monarchy back into a tradition that the public could take national pride in. He was also to take a large role in international foreign policy. As the 1890s had come to a close, two men had come to the forefront as important international players. Interestingly, both of them were leaders of major nations and Edward's nephews. The first was Tsar Nicholas II, son of Edward's sister-in-law, who came to the Russian imperial throne in 1894. The second and more concerning nephew was William, or Wilhelm, son of his elder sister Vicky, who had become Kaiser in 1888 upon the death of Edward's brother-in-law. William had had a difficult childhood, having suffered a difficult birth which withered one of his arms. He had also been forced to endure harsh treatment as he aged, and this made him into an aggressive and demanding man. William was growing ever more disgruntled with his English family, and began to detest them more and more. This was due to a multitude of reasons, but above all, it was his German pride that made him want to make sure that Germany was one of, if not the most powerful, nations in Europe. Britain could only stand in Germany's way in his mind, especially with the influence that the British royal family had with his mother Vicky, Edward's sister. William continued to grow ever more angry and aggressive as he aged, and over time, he and his uncle Edward began to form great distrust and dislike for one another. William snubbed Edward on many an occasion, and wrote disparagingly about his uncle behind his back. Things would never be good between Edward and William, despite brief reconciliations between Britain and Germany, and William being present at Queen Victoria's deathbed with the rest of her family. In 1899, the Second Boer War had broken out in South Africa, which was essentially a war over Britain's influence in South Africa. Things went poorly initially for Britain, and although Edward's nephew William was quick to gloat at Britain's initial losses, he was annoyed when Britain was eventually able to turn the tide of the war and win victory in 1902, despite his support of the Boers. The power of the monarch in Britain had slowly been withered away over the previous centuries, and the constitutional monarchs of the 19th and 20th century were a far cry from the absolutist-minded kings of ages past who could wield much more power over Parliament. But one aspect where the king still had influence was in foreign policy, and Edward took his foreign policy role seriously, especially being the uncle of the Tsar and the Kaiser. He was instrumental in entering into the Entente Cordiale with the French, which saw a serious increase in positive Anglo-French relations due to coming to terms in an array of issues, but most notably colonial boundaries. This was not a formal alliance, but was a precursor to the Anglo-French alliance that would be formed at the outbreak of World War I years later. French opinion of Britain was very low at the time, and Edward played a key role in befriending the president and morphing public opinion in France to be more positive towards the UK. Two camps were emerging on the continent, a Franco-Russian camp led by the French and Edward's nephew Tsar Nicholas, and a German camp which was led by Edward's other angry nephew William and the German statesmen like Otto von Bismarck that surrounded him. German aggression on the continent was growing, and this, mixed with the poor relationship Edward had with his nephew the Kaiser, presumably led the new king to lean towards the French and the Russians. The positive relations between Britain, France, and Russia only angered William further, and Germany began to fear continental encirclement, which only made them more aggressive. There was potential trouble with Russia that arose as well. The Russians went to war with Japan in 1904 and were defeated. Britain had been an ally to the Japanese for some time, and the Russians suspected the British of secretly lending the Japanese support 
despite being neutral publicly in the war. Anti-British sentiment began to rise in Russia as well, and this was only quelled by Edward's intervention. He was able to reassure his nephew, Tsar Nicholas, who was seen as relatively weak by Britain and Germany, that Britain was a friendly ally, and this meant that Russia was unwilling to lead towards Kaiser William and the Germans in the end. It should also be noted, however, that in reality, France was Russia's true ally, and it was them who put pressure on Russia to come to terms with Britain in the so-called Anglo-Russian Convention of 1907. Edward's role in Russia may have been less influential than in France, but it was not completely absent, as he worked hard to gain his nephew the Tsar's trust and affections. Although Edward and his nephew William feigned friendliness, in reality they were growing increasingly hostile towards each other, and this caused Germany to set about accelerating a program of shipbuilding that they had been pursuing. As Europe creeped ever closer to war, Edward remained as an important international figure, but there was a serious problem. His health was fading. The concern over Germany's shipbuilding program grew in Britain, and despite Edward's best efforts, he was not able to influence his nephew, or the German powers that be, to slow their pace in this regard. Relations between London and Berlin continued to deteriorate, and this, mixed with Austria's decision to annex Bosnia and Herzegovina, formerly controlled by the Ottoman Turks, meant that Europe was bracing itself for war. Although Edward made attempts to prevent war, in reality, the inevitable creep towards hostile action was perhaps an indication that Edward was not as powerful or influential as he thought he was. His attempts to ally himself with the powers that encircled Germany only furthered the advance towards war, no matter how much he or the British may have wanted to avoid it. He also supported Britain's shipbuilding program to rival Germany's. Interestingly, there were two political opponents that were instrumental in opposing this idea, and they together would bring forth the last difficult public dilemma of Edward's life. These men were none other than David Lloyd George, a liberal politician from Wales, and a young Winston Churchill, the famous British Bulldog who was still coming into his own at the time. Both of these men had angered the king in their parliamentary opinions previously, and in April 1909, these two presented and supported the so-called People's Budget, which proposed to tax Britain's wealthy in order to fund social welfare programs. Unfortunately, Edward eventually found himself in a similar predicament that King William IV had found himself in during his short reign in the 1830s. The bill was passed in the Commons, but was thrown out by the Lords, thus provoking a constitutional crisis. An election would need to be called, but the Liberals now wanted to limit the power of the House of Lords completely, and this ended up being the main issue of the new election. The Lords, of course, would not go for this, as it would take much of their power away, and so Edward was prodded to create new peers in order to flood the House of Lords with pro-reform members. Doing so would destroy the nature of the House of Lords and cede to the demands of one party, but not doing so would bring forth a crisis in Britain as the government would likely resign and the crown could risk being identified with opposition to democracy. This, of course, is a gross oversimplification of what was transpiring, but in the end it would not matter. It would not be Edward who would have to deal with this issue, but his son George, due to the fact that Edward would not live long enough to see the issue come to a head. By 1910, Edward was an aged man. He for years had smoked like a chimney, and as stated previously, took in between 11 and 13 cigars a day, mixed with 20 or so cigarettes in between. He had also begun to eat and drink more heavily after he had ascended to the throne as well, which was brought on by the stress that resulted from having such a high stakes job for the first time in his life. International drama only increased this stress tenfold. His weight had increased dramatically after becoming king, and this, unsurprisingly, brought forth many physical ailments that began to plague him as time went on. He soon developed bronchitis, and although he recovered for a time, he continued to smoke cigars nonstop. His breath often was strained, especially when doing basic exercise like climbing stairs, and he began to have bouts of intense coughing. Still, he insisted on smoking cigars as much as he could. Edward began to experience sleepless nights, incessant coughing, fever, and worst of all, breathlessness. The only thing that seemed to soothe him was the very thing that was killing him, his cigars. By May, he was unable to sit up in his chair and unable to speak due to coughing fits and attempts to draw breath. At one point, while walking in his bedroom, he fainted, at which point oxygen was administered constantly. It was clear that this was the end of the old king. He soon drifted in and out of consciousness, and his family and mistress, Alice Keppel, were summoned. 
Prince George indicated to his dying father that his horse had won at Kempton Park, at which point Edward was said to have spoken his last recorded words, I am glad. He soon after suffered a heart attack which put him into a coma. On May 6, 1910, at Buckingham Palace in London, England, King Edward VII of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland died. He was 68 years old and had only reigned for nine years. Edward lied in state, where it was said that over 400,000 of his subjects paid their respects to the king, far more than had mourned the loss of his mother Victoria. On the 20th of May 1910, Edward was laid to rest in the royal vault at St. George's Chapel in Windsor. He was later moved into a tomb to lie next to his wife Alexandra after her death in 1825, still at St. George's Chapel. They were once again moved in 1927 to the South Isle, where a tomb and tomb effigies of the royal couple had been created. Edward lies here next to his wife Alex to this day. The life and reign of Edward VII is an odd and interesting story to discuss. From his early youth, perhaps even his birth, the young Edward experienced the difficulties of being unwanted or disliked by his parents. He was compared to his elder and more capable sister, while unfortunately being less loved or encouraged due to his inability to learn as quickly as her. As the years went on, the constant bombardment of criticism unsurprisingly led the young prince to rebel in his own way, which brought forth a new exciting and publicly dangerous life for the young prince. Much of his life was spent idle, waiting for a time when he could take a serious role in the running of the country, and this had serious detrimental effects. Many princes in his position in decades past had experienced the same problem and had also handled their idleness or perhaps boredom poorly. There is certainly no shortage of criticisms of the first British king from the house of saxe coburg gotha His philandering ways were a disappointment to many, most notably his wife Alex, who was a faithful, capable, and loving wife. There were also many other women who suffered seriously as a result of his infidelity, and large prices could be paid by the women that he discarded. Although we discussed Harriet Mordaunt as one of these women, there were others who had similarly disastrous ends to their lives after coming into contact with Edward as Prince of Wales. His personality was much different than his mother's, and he was quick to make sure that those around him, friends or not, remembered his rank and the importance that went along with it. For this, he has often been portrayed as being somewhat conceited, famously being quick to forget his rank as long as everyone else remembered it. Some have also criticized his international politics as well, and have accused him of playing a major role in bringing the continent to the brink of war, which ultimately led to one of the deadliest conflicts in the 20th century. But despite these criticisms, there are many positive aspects to Edward's life and reign that can be put forward as well, or at least give some context or understanding to why Edward acted the way that he did. Edward was a product of his situation, and the secluded and lonesome childhood which he was forced into by his less than caring parents caused the unfortunate Edward to crave the attention and love that he was being refused. As he aged, he found this in the arms of mistresses and fast friends, which allowed him to finally experience the excitement and fun he was never able to have as a child. Despite his fast life, he did not discard his wife Alex, and continued to hold her in high regard despite his unfaithful ways. Bertie did care for his wife, but was unable to pull himself from the vices that he had developed over the years, and this most likely ran much deeper psychologically than people know. A major victory for Edward when it comes to him being viewed in the 21st century was his relationship with his children, as he was careful to avoid providing the same unhappy childhood that he had experienced to his own children, and was keen on including his son George in government when he became king. Edward also may have had pride about his rank, and by the fact that he was the heir to the throne, and he may have always wanted people to keep that in mind, but he was also much more open to the world than his mother had been, or the rest of the royal family for that matter. One must remember that it was Edward who grew in his philanthropy as Prince of Wales. It was Edward who allowed Jews into the Marlborough House, despite the criticisms that it brought. And it was Edward who brought the show, glamour, and magnificence back to the monarchy. Edward also worked hard to avoid international war. He was just unsuccessful in preventing it. In the end, he was a constitutional monarch, and there were many others who played important roles in the British government and international governments at the time. With the way things were shaking out on the continent, War was most likely inevitable, and many countries played a serious role in increasing hostilities, which included Austria, Russia, and most seriously, Germany. The continent may have been on the brink of war at Edward's death, but if anyone deserves the lion's share of the blame in this respect, it is Germany with their aggressive leadership. Edward's time as king was short, 
and one can only wonder how he would have ultimately handled the parliamentary crisis that was at hand when he died, or the First World War, assuming it was inevitable. Perhaps things would have shaken out differently. Nevertheless, no matter how one may look at Edward, as a king who brought the monarchy back to magnificence, or simply as a playboy prince, there can be no doubt of the importance that he played in the history of the British monarchy during his short time as king.